Più seguiamo le sue tracce, più la cucina rurale si svela come un vasto orizzonte. All'interno di questo spazio, comunità e i loro ecosistemi, agricoltori e cuochi si ritrovano su uno stesso cammino, spesso inconsapevoli della loro comune direzione. Questa sinergia deriva da una filosofia condivisa che nasce e si sviluppa in tempi e luoghi diversi. Ovviamente eh, la cucina contadina esiste dappertutto, esiste in tutti i paesi. E se c'è eh, qualcosa di un po' diverso nella, nella storia italiana è che questa cucina contadina fin da tempi molto antichi, e voglio dire fin dal Medioevo almeno, eh, è stata eh, accolta, trasformata, trasfigurata, arricchita, ma accolta anche all'interno dei ricettari di corte, dei ricettari delle, delle, delle classi privilegiate. E questo eh, significa che da molti secoli la cucina italiana, intesa nel suo, nella, nella sua integralità, ha eh, accolto appunto e rielaborato tanti elementi tipici della cucina contadina, ciò che non è avvenuto dappertutto nello stesso modo, perché in altri paesi eh, c'è stata una maggiore separazione fra il modo di mangiare nelle corti, il modo di mangiare nelle classi alte e il modo di mangiare dei contadini, che chiaramente anche in Italia è sempre stato enormemente diverso, ma in altri paesi è stato diverso nel senso proprio della separatezza. Ehm, questo vale per i paesi del nord, questo vale forse anche in qualche modo per la Francia, non perché la Francia non abbia una sua cultura e una sua tradizione di cucina contadina, ma perché l'elaborazione dell'alta cucina francese è avvenuta nelle città ad opera di cuochi professionisti. Germogli è il viaggio di Made in Nature alla ricerca delle radici del biologico per dimostrare come il biologico non sia soltanto un'alternativa, ma una realtà già saldamente legata alle nostre abitudini alimentari, alle tradizioni culinarie del passato e a quella cucina rurale da cui oggi vediamo sbocciare la cucina del futuro. A differenza di quanto avviene in Italia, nelle altre regioni europee, la cucina rurale impiega più tempo per influenzare e diventare parte integrante delle tradizioni culinarie. La separatezza a cui facenno Massimo Montanari, studioso di storia della gastronomia e professore all'Università di Bologna, dipende da una geografia politica che in Italia è frammentata, con città che sono come piccoli stati. Nei mercati quotidiani, città e campagna si fondono, dando inizio a un'interazione reciproca che ha profondamente influenzato la gastronomia italiana nel corso della sua storia. Tuttavia, come abbiamo visto, la difficoltà nel rintracciare in Europa la cucina rurale non implica necessariamente che essa non sia esistita, perché le tradizioni rurali delle campagne europee si sono diffuse fino agli inizi del Novecento, soprattutto all'interno delle famiglie, generazione dopo generazione, senza acquisire così una dimensione globale. Purtroppo, se vogliamo conoscere la cucina contadina, ci possiamo muovere solo in tempi molto recenti, perché solo a partire dall'Ottocento, a essere larghi, ma spesso solo a partire dal Novecento, eh, rimangono tracce dirette di questo mondo contadino, rimangono memorie scritte, rimangono diari, appunti di famiglia, quindi è una storia molto recente, è una storia molto recente e anche importante da recuperare per chi voglia fare una storia di questa cultura contadina. E come potrete immaginare, muoversi a ritroso tra ricette, diari e appunti di famiglia per ripercorrere l'origine di una tradizione è un lavoro duro, anzi una vera e propria missione, una missione a cui Elizabeth Luard 
ha dedicato la sua carriera e la sua vita. Negli anni 60, Leward non è ancora una giornalista di professione. È una donna curiosa, cresciuta fra il Sud America e la Gran Bretagna, con la passione per l'arte e le specie botaniche di cui riempie i suoi quaderni. Con il marito e quattro figli al seguito, decide di trasferirsi in Andalusia, preferendo l'incertezza e la vivacità della vita mediterranea, parole sue, a quella più inquadrata della Swinging London. In Spagna, dove vivrà per anni prima di trasferirsi in Francia, entra in contatto con la prima delle comunità rurali di cui, da lì a poco, comincerà a scrivere per il quotidiano The Field. Quei primi articoli sono solo l'inizio di una lunghissima carriera come food writer e illustratrice, ma sono anche l'incipit per quello che sarà The European Peasant Cookery, un testo capitale per comprendere, gustare e riscoprire il carattere rurale del vecchio continente. So I already had an understanding that what made people choose to cook the way they did was attitude. It wasn't recipes. It wasn't even ingredients because you substitute. If you don't have olive oil, you use goose fat in the middle of, you know, you, you put in stuff that you have around. So it's the attitude that, that, that mattered and that was what share, was shared. So because I had, let's say, my whole life until I was at least 40 looking at what I was going to write about, not knowing that I was going to write about, but also because I was a painter making records all the time of the, you know, the botany or the birds or wherever I was, because that seemed to come naturally. So by the time I started the book, I already knew what I was looking at. Probably started it in maybe 1983, something like that, 82. And I knew from experience that that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't want it to be called, what was it called in the States? Um, the Old World Kitchen. I, uh, anyway, I wanted it to be called Peasant. And they said, no, no, you can't do that because that's potatoes and it's poor and it's, you know. And I said, no, it's not. And then I knew I had to um, prove what I was saying, because it it's not enough just to say, this is what I've seen. You have to have backup, which is when I went to libraries. So all the way through European peasant cookery, you will find masses of quotes, 19th century travelers, some are even 18th century, early 20th century, um, women and clergy, Um, priests, they notice domestic. So you're sort of looking for the reverend, whatever it is, and the women. And then they will be botanists because the 19th century women on the whole, that's what they, that was a backstory. And often they'll give me the Latin and they will be describing, um, the men are usually describing battlefields and, you know, <laughs> buildings and that kind of thing but the women will be traveling maybe for their health they'll be in rural situations and because they are foreigners in a strange land and they've never seen this thing they'll write down what they see very often in quite considerable detail because it's surprising i mean you know um if you don't know somewhere and it was at a, most of them by kind of 19th century um late middle, late 19th century, early 20th, which was when the English started traveling. If I want to know about what's going on in England, I will look for, he's a Swiss diplomat, Missoni. He was traveling in Britain, 17 something or other. And he was looking at something that was strange to him. So he was describing something with innocent eyes, which is what you have to have. You've got to have, you know, That's what you know nothing eyes. So uh, throughout the book, that is what underpins. So you can't argue with me if I say this is what's happening in uh Pau Tukaino in um 1980 something, if also Teresa Sasilescu has said exactly the same thing in 1880. And that's the joy of it. And that was just quite a breakthrough. So that's where that comes from. 
an underlying absolute understanding of what I was looking at in a small area and that that could be applied throughout Europe. And then probably I can push it on. Nelle pagine del suo libro, Luard recupera le ricette e le tradizioni di zone solo sfiorate dalla letteratura gastronomica di metà anni Ottanta. Lo fa dando voce alle testimonianze dei libri di viaggio, dei ricettari e raccontando le proprie esperienze sul campo. Quello che scopre, soprattutto, è che non si tratta di confini o distanze geografiche, ma che, quando si parla di cucina rurale, tutti i paesi del territorio europeo, da quelli del Mediterraneo a quelli scandinavi, passando per quelli della Mittele Europa, condividono un passato comune di conoscenze e soluzioni. Well, borders are political, you know, um, they're just, they're pretty irrelevant in terms of how people live. The only things that matter are um, latitude, um, climate. Uh, latitude is very important because in Turkey, they've probably got a 11 month growing season. In the south of Italy, again, an 11 month growing season. North of Italy, you're probably down to about eight or nine. So the fact that you then have to work out a way of storing food without, um, well, refrigeration is very new. I mean, the change in everything has been so new. So our fear of food has grown at the same speed as we have forgotten, you know, what, what it was about. So we, we really fear it now because we don't know what's in it. Whereas your grandmother knew exactly what was in it. You know, she might well have gone down to the mill to get the flour. She probably took her own olives to have and stood there until she got the same olive back. So, you know, th that kind of attitude is, um, that's real knowledge. And that's something that, you know, it's, it's, you can be professor of the most important university in the world, but you won't have that. And I was really aware of that you know, that this well of knowledge was, I wasn't even thinking that it might be disappearing when I, you know, was writing. So that's what, when I was um, writing European Peasant Cookery, that was what I was looking for. This is what this person does, which is, was helped by the fact that before I was a food writer, I was a botanical painter, a proper one, you know, working for, Kew and, you know, the botanical gardens and things like that, and a bird painter uh, working for um, a gallery in, in Bond Street. So perfectly respectable career on that, um, which gave me an underlying understanding of landscape. So I can walk, I can pretty much tell you what's alien in a landscape and what it will produce. And if I know what the wild food is, I can i will know how it became um, the agricultural situation. And, and that, those sort of subtleties that, you know, you don't usually associate with um, food writing, that they're really important, you know, because they dictate how people see things. So what you're looking at is an attitude of mind rather than a recipe. So I think that's probably what I was trying to do. I was not trying to say these, you know, the sad male is done differently in Romania than it is in Bulgaria and than it is in, it came from, from Turkey. Yeah, a bit of that. But on the other hand, it's those things that link people and that the understanding that comes through recognizing something. What about rice? I mean, the Ottoman, the movement of the Ottomans through Europe i didn't go into the Slavs because I could see that the Ottomans were incredibly important in terms of their influence on the cooking. I mean, you get a strudel, which is basically um, Turkish um, filo wrapping up a German dumpling. You know, it's got apples in it. It's an apple strudel. And it's not a great big flowery white dumpling bready thing. It's a fine filo. And that's, you know, those sort of things are just, you, you don't, in a way, you don't need to, you don't need to define them and say, this is a rule. You need to say, this is an attitude. It's not a rule. It's not a recipe. 
It's an attitude, and the attitude is don't throw anything away, eat in season, mostly plants, don't kill an animal unless, you know, it's no longer producing milk or eggs or whatever it is that you want from it. Quando sfogliamo le oltre 500 ricette che compongono The European Peasant Cookery, vediamo una mentalità, ancor prima di singole tradizioni divise per paesi. È un tratto comune che avvicina, per esempio, i piatti della campagna francese a quelli italiani, perché simili nelle metodologie di conservazione, nelle scelte di cottura e nell'utilizzo degli ingredienti come risorse. La mentalità rimane, perché si rinnova continuamente e si adatta alle storie che incontra. È la modalità in cui la cucina rurale ci parla oggi, attraverso l'agricoltura biologica e l'esigenza di stabilire una nuova mentalità, a partire da ciò che già conosciamo. The value is like any raconteur, the story. That's what draws people in. So story about people. You know, that's, that, will, that will bring people in. And at that point, the recipe is already halfway there. You know, you're talking, you're talking with a, and children or adults or any reader responds to stories which is why there are so many food memoirs around. Everybody's writing a food memoir because the story is what, is what draws you in. And then you look at the value of it and the value of it is don't throw anything away, eat seasonally, eat locally, all the stuff that comes in over the top. You know, that's without that backstory and that um, this, is, this is real. This is not an intellectual exercise. And um, it's like when you teach children to taste things, you know? And no, it's not scary, taste it. I did a book on um, children's first, well, feeding children and babies, um, what babies respond to, because I watched babies, I had four of them, you know? <laughs> and you can teach them, you know, a little bit of chili. Oh, good heavens, you know. And then is it the, it's the excitement of chili. So I think the stories, that's you get an appetite for storytelling if you read those stories. If you just come into it as a kind of list of ingredients and then this is what you do. So, you know, there's a there's a whole that that the storyline is will, will draw them in and make them value it. And then when you look at a landscape next time, you'll know when you go to a farmer's market when you go traveling, you won't sit in the Costa del Sol stuffing yourself on fish and chips. You know, you will probably go and have a look and see what they're doing. And I know that works because I can't have, I can't have a universal overview, but because I had four children, I have seven grandchildren. So I've been through that process. So I, that's what works, the storyline. Tell the story first and then say, this is how you can get the feeling of it. And then you're away, you know, all the rest follows. Don't throw anything away. Yes, it's edible. If somebody else can eat it, probably you can. Look at what's on the label. Eat locally. The Michael Pollan thing, you know, eat, what is it? Eat um, not too much plant food. Um, eat, eat, eat food, <laughs> mostly plants. Nothing your grandmother wouldn't um, recognize as food. È possibile allora, seguendo il cammino e il lavoro di Elizabeth Luard, ricostruire il nostro legame con il cibo e considerarlo come un punto di partenza per creare nuove storie. Di questo parleremo nella prossima puntata, riscoprendo l'importanza dei ricettari e di quello che continuano a raccontarci generazione dopo generazione. Avete ascoltato Germogli. Il podcast sulla cucina rurale e l'agricoltura biologica prodotto da Made in Nature, il progetto europeo per la promozione e la diffusione dei valori del biologico in Italia, Francia, Germania e Danimarca. <totipo>